this this south south north relationship that you brought brought and some of the examples you brought are very very useful and i think we should uh, when we do the recommendation i think these ideas we should include them thank you very much now i go to uh, sorry Sheikh. Dr. Sheikh Bez, this is your turn now. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Mamu, uh, uh, Professor Lisa, uh, and uh, Dr. De Declan. It's indeed a privilege to speak at the second United Nations uh, General Assembly mm -hmm. Summit. I'd like to express my sense of gratitude to United Nations, ISC, for hosting such a riveting discussion about science, innovation, and technology. Uh, well, before proposing my argument later in the speech, I'd like to open with a bit of history. The poet and femme's assist is Eliot pointed out that history is a great teacher. In a similar vein, Professor Jem Keynes in 1936 underlined the significance of taking into account the past when reflecting on the present and future. It's crucial to respect history if we wish to move forward. Only by reflecting on history can we give full weight to the paths, methods, and institutions that have brought us to where we are today. In other words, an insightful understanding of the past can help us promote economic prosperity, social justice, and environmental sustainability, all without compromising people's equity, dignity, and agency. In regard to innovation, the history of wealthy nations suggests that prosperity follows from breakthroughs tied to backwardness. For example, Europe is generally considered to be rich, but in the 17th century, Europe was so impoverished that many residents were labeled as unwashed masses. Professor Jeff, Jeffrey Sachs argued that prior to industrialization, humanity lived in rural areas for millennia, and most of these people relied on agriculture to live. The conditions in non-European countries were even worse. Poverty was unyielding in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Disease, famine, and inequality were all over the place, and they appeared impossible to remove. However, many so-called poor countries soon witnessed tremendous economic and technological prosperity. The 17th and 18th centuries brought massive industrialization around the world, first in Northwestern Europe and then in other non-European countries. Professor McCloskey argued that this phase led to a revolution, the likes of which no society had ever seen before. And this extraordinary journey from extreme poverty to tremendous prosperity has also served as a beacon of hope for struggling nations everywhere. It's also a reminder that the models that have led to the wealth of nations are able to be replicated. Meanwhile, the events and institutions which have historically perpetuated poverty can be avoided. But even with these advances, we still face an unanswered question. What factors, incentives, and conditions lead to the prosperity and poverty of nations? And what insights can be gleaned from prosperous nations' evolution? Personally, as an innovation researcher, I stand with economic historians and development scholars who hold innovation as paramount. To put it in another way, the wealth of nations is linked to a thriving innovation culture, and a lack of it will almost surely lead to poverty and serfdom. Professor McCloskey specifically considers innovationism to be the big story of the past two centuries because it has enabled many formerly and ignorant people to flourish. There is, however, one caveat to be aware of. Wealthy nations have also benefited over time from colonialism, the subjugation of small states, and the expropriation of slaves' power. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, in his latest book, even goes so far as to call the economic system born in England a ruthless, violent affair that failed to address inequality. As a result, no single factor like geographical advantage, the presence of creative men or women, or an ideal culture is responsible for what we know today as an industrial revolution. To create a culture of growth, prosperity, power, wealth, many economic development researchers believe that the convergence of geography, culture, technology, and institutions is critical. However, an issue that continues to baffle researchers is how to identify an optimal way of ensuring sustainability, dignity, and economic prosperity. It remains unknown exactly which technological paradigm and innovation models are best positioned to foster growth and inclusion. Thus far, we have seen three innovation trajectories emerge in the history of technology. Trajectory first, which appeared in England during the first industrial revolution, it mostly involved you know, around inventions and original innovations. Trajectory second came after industrial revolution and captures the outcomes of positive knowledge externality that evolved through imitation, lessons, reverse engineering, and borrowed technology. And trajectory third, that's underpinned by the organic nature of grassroots and frugal innovations. 
Dr. Bahaduri would say that these innovations are driven by non-market, non-for-profit incentives and are meant to fill the gaps created by the market. In relation to that, Professor Lee, who is also in the panel, and Professor Shabha Wu uh, contend that beginning in the 1960s, less developed countries like Korea, India, and China began to adopt technological models to catch up, and many countries have leapfrogged into new technological paradigms. Yet, the wealth inequality, stagflation, environmental disasters, and middle income traps resulting from the recent recession have brought to light the weakness of dominant innovation growth models. Inequality is reaching levels not seen since 19th century, while the rates of productivity enhancing innovations continue to slow. Climate change disasters and COVID-19 pandemics are threatening global prosperity as well. In fact, Professor Lenz outlined three kinds of nations when discussing wealth inequality. Speaking metaphorically in terms of food, Professor Lenz would argue that there are nations whose residents spend money to lose weight, nations whose residents eat to live, and nations whose residents are not sure when they will eat next. So there is a clear issue at hand here. Current innovation models seem dysfunctional given the magnitude of the world problems. Take COVID-19 as an example. The pandemic has exposed top-down elitist models of governance and growth. A policy cry for the appraisal of dominant innovation and growth models has come to the fore. Even experts at the United Nations have earlier started advocating for hybrid models of innovation to address global concerns about poverty, inequality, and climate change. The demand for a more democratized models of innovation is growing in kind. As indicated by Professor Fegerberg, innovation is still seen as a first world activity. Given these considerations, I'd like to propose that we reframe the narrative around innovation. We should concentrate on new innovation models that use fewer resources while ensuring inclusivity and long-term viability. We have seen that innovation can bring people out of poverty. This is the right time to consider what Professor Sachs calls compassionate innovation systems as a way to promote economic inequality. I studied grassroots innovators along with my thesis supervisor, Dr. Bahadri, for more than a decade in India. I have no doubt if frugal grassroots innovations are scaled up fairly, many of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals can be realized without excluding people. In particular, I'm interested in blending Professor Wu's concept of secondary innovations with low cost and frugal innovation models. Doing so, the South-South Learning Corridor and South-North Corridor will be strengthened and a peaceful and inclusive alternative to the dominant Northern innovation models will emerge. The diffusion of innovation is infamously uneven. So it's time to explore alternative models in pursuit for a more harmonious world. The notion of secondary innovation suggests that endogenous innovation do not necessarily need the original form or take the original form. They can also come from innovations related to say foreign technology gain. Professor Wu and colleagues have pointed out that secondary innovations can engender in spaces that are dealing with what Professor Lee would call institutional voids, limited resources and technological constraints. The important thing about secondary innovation, however, is that it also fulfills the basic principles of frugality. The tenet is according to Professor Bharti include reuse, repurposing, rapidity and recombining. Put simply, when knowledge flows freely, it's possible to mitigate disasters that threaten all of humanity. Secondary frugal digital innovations we have witnessed in China in the form of Taobao villages and Pindodo have lately risen to prominence in China as a major instruments for poverty reduction and grassroots entrepreneurship. Well, since World War II, rich countries have experimented with multiple ways to lift nations out of poverty. The world has spent a huge dollar 4.5 trillion to help poorer countries. But unfortunately, we have yet to achieve inclusion. There are more poor countries now than they were in 1960s. That's why new models of innovation are so profoundly needed. In closing, I agree with Professor Joshua Gans and policymaker Andrew Lake, who in their book, Innovation, Policy Equality, argue that our world needs Promethean innovators. In Greek mythology, Prometheus defied the gods by stealing fire from heaven and giving it to the humans along with other skills. Promethean innovators are willing to share the secrets of the few for the greater good of humanity. We need to celebrate people and organizations who take risks to improve life for everyone. After all, true innovation isn't measured by wealth. The power of innovation is most evident in how many it helps and how well it does so. Thank you very much, Professor Mom. Thank you so much. Uh, we, there was very uh, a lot of wisdom that you shared.